All right. I'm calling us back to order. List is WA4, Shallow Lake and Wetland Protection Restoration Program Phase 11. I, I, nobody's commented about how good I am at reading these numbers that aren't really numbers. I haven't made any mistakes yet. But John, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. I'm John Schneider from Ducks Unlimited. I manage our conservation programs throughout the state from my home office in Alexandria, Minnesota. This is my first trip into the Twin Cities since March of 2020, so thank you for bringing me down, but uh, this is a great venue, much better than, no offense, than the Capitol. Um, I work with three biologists from Ducks Unlimited and six engineers, and as a team, we focus on restoring, enhancing, and protecting wetlands for waterfowl in Minnesota. Uh, this morning, you've heard from lots of other groups about waterfowl and waterfowl habitat, but this is our mission. This is the only thing that Ducks Unlimited does is worry about wetlands and waterfowl habitat. So as a context for this proposal, I'd like to briefly overview, review our mission and the needs of ducks in, in Minnesota. Um, you know, while goose and swan populations throughout North America are doing fairly well, uh, we're still concerned about duck habitat. Ducks are a little more vulnerable and much more reliant on wetlands. Uh, more than 20 species of ducks migrate through the state every fall, sometimes as many as 30. Um, loss of breeding wetlands and degraded migration habitat here, wetland habitat here, is why we see fewer ducks in Minnesota than we do in the past, than we did in the past. Um, our shallow lakes and marshes are degraded for migrating birds, but for breeding ducks, uh, we basically lost most of our prairie pothole wetlands. Over 90% of our prairie wetlands in southern Minnesota have been drained and lost, lost to agriculture and development. In the northeast of Minnesota, luckily, we've still got about 90% wetlands remaining on the landscape. Uh, but in the prairie pothole region, the duck factory of North America, which Minnesota is part of, it remains a conservation crisis. So this is where we're focusing our efforts to restore drained wetlands. Many of those, most of those drained wetlands remain on private land. So in order to restore them, we either have to purchase an easement or purchase the land and fee title. And this proposal is the tool in our toolbox where we can offer to purchase the land and fee title to get to the wetlands that we can restore. That's our purpose. So this proposal is phase 11 of an ongoing land acquisition and restoration program in southwestern Minnesota in partnership with the Minnesota DNR through which we focus on land for sale from willing seller private landowners uh, with drained wetlands uh, near existing wildlife management areas that must be purchased in order to restore those wetlands. These are tracts of land that are for sale and the landowners are not interested in doing an easement which you'll hear about next from uh, my colleague from the Board of Water and Soil Resources. So many public lands in southwest Minnesota, the existing lands are small fragmented patches of habitat that are surrounded by uh, private land with great restoration potential. Most public lands in southwest Minnesota are simply too small to function optimally to, for breeding ducks and other uh, wetland wildlife. The science we have indicates that at least 40% of a four square mile area uh, needs to be in idle grassland and wetlands in order for waterfowl ducks to have a viable chance of breeding successfully to produce enough offspring to um, overcome predation in the spring, to have a net production of ducklings. Some of these public lands are managed shallow lakes with a, just a thin ribbon of, of upland prairie around them. Uh, many, the, the entire WMA system was based on the Save the Wetlands Act, which some of you remember from years ago. That's the foundation for which Minnesota DNR actually has wildlife management areas in the state. It stemmed from the Save the Wetlands Act. 
And back in those days, there wasn't a State Wetland Conservation Act, so in order to save the wetlands, they had to buy the wetlands. Now we have the State Wetland Conservation Act that protects those wetlands. But so many of our WMAs are very small in that regard and just the wetland basin. So we need to add uplands around them with small wetlands to build complexes of habitat. And that's what we're trying to do through this program. So we strategically focus on land with drained wetlands next to or nearby existing state wildlife management area lands to make them bigger complexes, more functional for breeding ducks and other wildlife. And of course, these areas are open to public hunting as well. Uh, through this proposal, DU proposes to work strategically with willing seller private landowners um, and purchase uh, 1,200 acres, 240 acres of which are drained wetlands and 960 acres of prairie. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with the Minnesota DNR. We buy the land, we restore the land, we transfer the land to the Minnesota DNR. Uh, regarding the past progress, uh, there's a handout, and in our proposal, as you can see, we've spent most of the past money that's been appropriated on land acquisition. Um, uh, we're 80 percent of our way spent through laws of 2020 funding, uh, and we're moving into restoration. We're starting to spend laws of 21 money. This request is to continue the program into the future. Um, I think I'll stop there and uh, open it up to any questions. Questions? I had a question for you. Yes, sir. Your, your budget for staff is <coughs> 890000 but it's for seven years of staff. But you're spending your money in three or four. I'm not following how that makes sense. Mr. Chair, Council Members, um, that's a great observation and basically that's a function of trying to describe FTEs in the proposal budget and pro project how long it might take us to do this work. Our goal is to finish in, in five years, buy land in three years and two or three to restore. So it's, it's, it's not a finite calculation, it's more of a function of trying to project what it might cost us to do this work and how long it might take us and convert that into an FTE. So if you got the work done in five, would it reduce the staff cost, I guess? Mr. Chair, council members, it could. I just don't know, frankly. I can't, can't project at that finite. Um, and I, I will take the opportunity of saying since this proposal went in, the land market in, in the prairie part of the country has changed dramatically, and so it's all subject to change. We're now going into a, uh, land prices have gone up 20% in the last six months due to crop prices, and so everything's taking much longer now than it did when, <laughs> when I th was thinking about this proposal in March and April, so. You've got another six months and things will change again. Other questions? Apparently not, thank you. Thank you. Next is WA5, Rim Wetlands, Restoring Most Productive Habitat in Minnesota's Prairie Pothole Region. Go Good ahead. morning. Um, Chairman Hartwell and council members. My name is John Vaz. I uh, am a RIM easement and working land specialist with the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. I'll be talking about wetlands today. Uh, I'm the new project manager for the wetlands program. Uh, so this is my first time in front of the council. Um, if you look at the title, it's uh, wetlands Restoring the most productive habitat in Minnesota. And let's be frank, it's basically wetlands phase 11. Um, and we have come to the council for 11 times and we realize that it's getting a little tired, um, but it doesn't take away from the fact of all the great things that the RIM program is doing in the state of Minnesota. 
Um, I would like to start off with some, uh, in response to a Chairman Hartwell's comment um, about 2017 and 2018 appropriations um, only being half spent. Um, particularly in 2017 appropriation, 80% um, of the overall appropriation was shown as spent with the status update in July. And in 2018 appropriation, 82% of the overall approp was also shown as spent. And much of that funding that is left on the acquisition line is for restoration reimbursements. Um, no more easements can be funded with the 2016 and 2017 approps. But in 2018, we will fund a handful, maybe five or less of applications due to cancellations. And we intend to spend that with the most recent batching periods um, in association with the CREP program. Funds haven't been encumbered in SWIFT, but internally we have committed the remaining funds to the applicants. In addition, uh, in 16, 17, and 18 appropriations, all of those are for CREP. They're, they're, uh, our involvement with the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, uh, with the United States um, Department of Agriculture, um, and let's, let's be frank, when you work with um, an outside agency, and particularly a federal agency, um, it can take some time. Um, there's like stops and starts um, unforeseen things that pop up. But the important thing in our last uh, request for phase 10 and the request for today, those are completely separate from CREP. Uh, they are standalone RIM. Um, the last time we did a standalone RIM was in 2015, and that was right at the end of uh, a partnership that we had with the WRP program. Um, and we spent that money very quickly. Um, it was on the tail end of our partnership. Um, and so we can show that we can definitely move money quickly to landowners uh, if it's a standalone RIM. Um, the amendments proposed for 2017 and 18 will be discussed with council in a few months as a result of changes in federal leverage and land prices over the last five to six years. Uh, we have historically used all landowner easement payments very quickly with the RIM only signups. And we fully realize, and I'm sure you do, that restoration work does take time, especially when we use a reimbursement model for this work. Um, Last, our last appropriation, um, um, the council did grant us some, some uh, appropriation and we are anticipating that we will be unrolling that um, next spring um, at the tail end of our CREP. Uh, CREP should be winding down by that time um, and we feel that we can uh, ride that wave of uh, of CREP applicants. Um, CREP has been very successful, as you, as you, as you know. Um, we found out over time that restoration is the number one um, priority for uh, landowners. As a matter of fact, in CREP, we didn't anticipate that up to 90% of all applicants were for wetland restoration. So we feel that, you know, with this appropriation, um, we can definitely move that money quickly. And that is basically my summary. Um, I figured I would just keep it short and sweet. Um, like, like I said, we've been at this table um, a while, um, but wetlands are definitely the most productive habitat that we can do to restore. Um, water quality and provide habitat. Um, I've been involved with working with landowners and RIM for 25 plus years. Uh, I can I can tell you that landowners are very 
interested in this in this program. Uh, it's a private land easement. Um, it stays on the tax rolls, and landowners don't have a problem with that. I think that's a, a unique thing to uh, address. So with that, um, I would open it up to questions. Questions? Looks like you answered all the questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Next is uh, WRE01, Living Shallow Lake Enhancement and Wetland Restoration Initiative, Phase 8. Good morning again, Mr. Chair, Council Members. John Schneider from Ducks Unlimited. Again, with me is Stacy Salvavold, Fish and Wildlife Service Biologist from the Fergus Falls Wetland Management District. Um, we are here working together. Um, we work with our respective DU and Fish and Wildlife Service teams to restore, protect, and manage uh, wetlands and prairie grassland habitats in Minnesota. Uh, this proposal before you is phase eight of our ongoing shallow lake enhancement and wetland restoration program, which focuses on enhancing the larger marshes and also enhancing and restoring smaller pothole wetlands around them on private land and under easement and on public waterfowl production areas. The justification for our work is that, as I mentioned earlier, 90% of Prairie Minnesota's wetlands have been drained and are lost, and the prairie wetlands that remain are often too degraded to support aquatic plants and invertebrates that breeding and migrating ducks require for food due to excessive nutrients, invasive fish such as carp, and uh, invasive plants like hybrid cattail, and also trees that tend to invade small pothole wetlands as well. This limits Minnesota's breeding duck population and also limits the length of time migrating ducks spend in Minnesota during both spring and fall migration due to the lack of aquatic foods. Ducks Unlimited's initiative strives to both enhance larger wetlands and shallow lake basins that were too deep to drain years ago and still remain while also focusing on enhancing and restoring smaller drained wetlands and enhancing degraded wetlands on public land too. Our goal is to make these basins as ecologically productive and as, pos as possible for waterfowl and other wildlife. Through this phase eight proposal, DU proposes to, with our partners at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, enhance 2,250 acres of shallow lakes and large marshes and wetlands by engineering and installing water level control structures uh, we will also enhance smaller pothole wetlands and adjacent prairie by removing sediment and trees and restoring uh, hydrology by blocking ditches and removing drain tile. All this work we do, we do through private contractors. Uh, we do not do this work ourselves. We hire private contractors following state procurement procedures uh, and to get this field work done. Additionally, we propose to restore an additional 550 acres of drain prairie pothole wetlands and grasslands on public WPAs and other lands permanently protected by conservation easements. Over 80% of our budget requests is for contracts. The remaining 20% is for DU engineering staff to design, survey, and manage the work in the field. As noted in fa uh, the handout, we've completed phases one through five and have spent 84 percent of phase six and we have already started spending our 2021 phase seven grant. Uh, right now it's literally being uh, spent on the ground as I speak. Uh, we anticipate running out of uh, OHF funds for this program by the end of 2022. Um, this exciting aspect of phase eight program this, this year is that we are expanding our work further with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to restore small drained 
wetlands and enhanced small drained, uh, degraded wetlands on older federal waterfowl production areas. And here to tell you more about this aspect of our work is uh, Stacy Selvable. Good morning, Chair and Council Members. Um, I'm Stacy Selvavold. I'm a wildlife biologist, as John mentioned, from the Fergus Falls Wetland Management District. Um, I do focus on projects throughout the state and um, different initiatives that uh, impact all of our districts throughout Minnesota. So I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, Fish and Wildlife Services focus right now, uh, which is on restoring and enhancing the quality of wetlands on our lands to ensure functional hydrology and longevity of those wetlands um, and the infrastructure that we build. Um, in light of the continuously changing climate and landscapes, uh, our goal is to, to achieve the longest lasting uh, infrastructure and the highest quality habitat that we can for wetland dependent wildlife. Over the past year, Fish and Wildlife Service and Ducks Unlimited have mapped over 1,800 wetlands in seven counties of Minnesota, focusing on landscapes that can support the most waterfowl and wetland-dependent wildlife. In addition, we have prepared wetland restoration enhancement designs for over 140 small wetlands on 11 waterfowl production areas. And that's what John was talking about. Um, there are contractors beginning that work as we speak. Uh, to do those wetland restorations. So those 140 basins will be uh, restored over uh, this fall and next spring. And this is just the beginning of what we're hoping to work on. Uh, the service has looked at over 400 waterfowl production areas in Minnesota and would like to review the infrastructure on them and try to create more hydrologically functional uh, wetland restorations. So. We're also partnering with Ducks Unlimited on a couple of large projects this year. So um, one of those is a shallow lake project here in the Twin Cities. It's the Chaska Lake Project at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. It will enhance a shallow lake that's right in the heart of the city of Chaska. Refuge staff have called it one of the, mo one of the most productive lakes on the refuge, uh, but its structure has failed basically due to landscape changes around it over the years. Um, this, this lake is surrounded by walking paths, and it's quite close to the Rapids Lake Environmental Education Center, uh, where the, the refuge does a, quite a bit of um, environmental education for the, the uh, Carver, Carver County School District. Uh, the refuge uh, shared with us that they have seen a five times increase in visitation over the past couple of years. Um, we do you know, as we're all out here outside today, uh, folks have been able to get outside and recreate and use their public lands more. Uh, in light of COVID and other constraints being inside, um, those opportunities to be outside on the refuge within the city have um, been utilized immensely. Uh, the refuge manager, Serena Selbo, said uh, folks are re-loving their, um, their wetlands and their national wildlife refuge. Uh, even in spite of the last, um, you know, opportunities that we've had to go back inside, they're continuing to see their visitation be almost three times higher than what it was prior to COVID. So it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, Ducks Unlimited and the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to work on a project that can be enjoyed by uh, community members in Chaska as well as uh, the local youth. So our... Our uh, second major project that we're working on with Ducks Unlimited is out at Big Stone National Wildlife Refuge, which is on the South Dakota-Minnesota border. It's a critical migration stopover for waterfowl, shorebirds, and other waterbirds. Um, the Pool 4 4A project will take uh, what is currently a very passive system for water management and convert that to give us the opportunity to actively manage water levels to benefit those species. So. We're excited about that change. Um, it will just allow us to, to make better habitat available to those wildlife species as they're migrating through. So, so Ducks, on work, Ducks Unlimited has been actively working with the service uh, to design infrastructure that will meet those goals, as I talked about, to improve our quality of uh, both infrastructure and wetland habitat uh, throughout Minnesota. So. Um, we're excited to see those changes continue, and we thank you very much for your time and consideration of the proposal today. John and I will happily field your questions. Questions? Jamie. 
Uh, thank you for your proposal. Sorry, Jamie Swenson. Um, I've, I've seen the, these projects on the ground and it's really, really great work that you're doing. Question on the, the appropriation request amount and what's been historically appropriated. Now you mentioned using private contractors is, and we've talked in the past about having some, some uh, shortage of people that can do the work. If, if there was more uh, than the typical three to four million dollars uh, allocated, would there be any issues with resources to be able to do the work? Mr. Chair, Council Members, Council Member Swenson, uh, good question. I, I think we would have to strategically time the work. We couldn't put all the work out to bid at the same time. But your point's a really good one. Depending on the time of year, we do run into situations where, for example, contractors that specialize in tree removal, for example, uh, you know, get busy and contractors obligate themselves and to stay in business you have to have a steady stream of work so we would the more money we were appropriated the more strategically we'd have to think about timing of getting work out to bid it would be a nice problem to have um, and i'm i'm serious because i would be able to encourage our staff to be putting work out for bid in the fall and for work the next year you know I, we would just advance that whole process months ahead of time. Any other questions? You've answered them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is WRE2 DNR Accelerated Shallow Lakes and Wetland Enhancements Phase 14. Good morning, um, Chairman Hartwell and council members. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Ricky Lean. I'm the head of the wetland habitat team in the uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife. To my right is Josh Cavanaugh, who is one of our senior shallow lake specialists in southeast Minnesota. And to my left is, um, I forgot his name for a second, John Miley, who is overseeing our brand new wetland management program and he works out of Glenwood. <clears throat> As always, I wanna begin with a thank you to the council for past funding you've given me. <clears throat> I can probably cut out a good chunk of my talk because you've heard two talks from John Schneider, who's more knowledgeable and a better speaker about the value of wetlands in the state and the value of doing work in those wetlands to restore and enhance them. Um, what I would like to spend a little time doing initially is talking about my programmatic request and especially for new council members um, maybe you wonder what it means by being programmatic <coughs> um, the council has been very good to give me money in my appropriations to grow my program and to also do habitat projects my proposals are typically broken into components that include not only targeted proposals or projects like water control structures, <clears throat> fish barriers, shallow lake drawdowns, and other projects focused on infrastructure and water level management, but they also include components to build up the program in a way to do more of this kind of work and to do it more effectively. Examples of programmatic requests from the past include seven years ago coming to you and asking for expanded funding for the roving habitat crews so they could do wetland work in addition to upland work. You gave us the ability to expand our one of a kind in a nation shallow lakes program so that we now have nine full-time people who are able to focus on bringing management to Minnesota's shallow lakes. We have a helicopter with equipment and funding to go out and spray 2,500 acres of cattails every year. And the last example I'll give of programmatic growth funded by OHF funds is our brand new wetland management program that John oversees. Like the Shell Lakes program, we are putting single focused wetland biologists on the landscape to bring about needed wetland management on public lands. 
the pandemic and the resulting DNR hiring freeze impacted that program as much as any in the DNR, but the results we're seeing with our initial staff are exciting and we're looking forward to filling the remaining positions and turning them loose on the landscape. So that's what I mean when I say programmatic. OHF appropriations have contributed to growing this program and doing the dedication or dedicated work needed on Minnesota wetlands. And I got a nice example of the results this week when I was working on the final report for the ML15 shallow lake and wetland enhancement appropriation. The accomplishment plan for that appropriation called for us to do a little over 8,700 acres of wetland work, which sounds good. The actual results that will show up in the final report, over 27,000 acres of wetland work. And that's in part due to the growth of the program through OHF funding. So let's move on to what we are asking for in the proposal in front of you, WRE02, Accelerated Shallow Lakes and Wetland Enhancement, Phase 14. I would typically include a component asking for roving habitat crew funding to allow them to do wetland habitat work, but that's going to be addressed in a different funding model in the future, so I don't have to include it in my request. I have one major component which takes up 85% of my funding request um, for 4.1 million for funding to implement a variety of individual habitat projects statewide. Most of these are addressing infrastructure needs and involving engineering and or construction of water control structures, but it also includes the costs associated with the drawdown of a shallow lake in southwest Minnesota. Funding for our annual use of the helicopter to go after hybrid cattails or other problem invasive wetland plants, and a major increase in our work to enhance existing wild rice, which I'll come back to if time permits. <clears throat> the smaller component of my request is simply to continue having a person available uh, to do administration We've been using past OHF funds for contract administrators, and uh, those funds are going to be expiring in the future, so we're planning ahead for when that happens, and we want to keep doing that work. Uh, I will just touch again briefly on wild rice work. I said earlier that part of our request for individual wetland work would be targeted to wild rice restorations and enhancement. If you live in Minnesota, you're living in the best place in the world for wild rice and there's a lot to like about it. I talked to you about it because a healthy stand of wild rice is about as good as it gets for waterfall habitat. Then you add in the fact that there's also cultural and economic value of wild rice, which adds to its importance in Minnesota. The DNR spends a lot of time and money trying to maintain what we have, but what does remain is only a fraction of what used to be out there, and there's a lot of work that could be done to enhance what remains or restore what we've lost. Some OHF proposals I've been involved with in the past have done great wild rice work enhancement work already. We are currently undertaking a project at Big Rice Lake with a standalone OHF appropriation that will look to see if we can take a wild rice water that's been overrun with pickerel weed and see if we can't return it to wild rice by mechanical removal of the pickerel weed and doing adjustments at the outlet. And within some of my programmatic requests, we've had individual projects that have enhanced wild rice. The request before you includes funding to increase these efforts in a meaningful way. The work would include seeding wild rice in appropriate basins, channel or outlet work to reduce high water levels, or trying to deal with vegetation or rough fish that might be impacting wild rice. It's an area of wetland management in which we can and should do more, and our goal is to use this OHF appropriation to jumpstart jump that work. Thank you for your attention, and John, Josh, and I would be happy to address any questions you might have. Questions? Well, we're doing well this morning. You're answering all our questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next is PA01, 
uh, accelerating the wildlife management areas program phase 14. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council Members. As you can see, uh, neither one of us is Aaron Sandquist. Um, as was mentioned earlier this morning, he is at home uh, quarantined, but uh, I can assure you he is texting me frequently to make sure that we are doing everything that we are supposed to be doing. So uh, my name is Sabin Adams. I'm the Minnesota Project Manager with Pheasants Forever, and I drug along our Restoration Manager, Eric or Alex Nelson, um, to help me out as moral support this morning. So today uh, we are going over the Accelerating the Wildlife Management Area uh, Phase 14 program. Uh, this is a long-standing program that has seen many successes, and each one of those successes helps deliver the conservation objectives of not just Pheasants Forever and our members, but also the broader conservation community of Minnesota, as well as the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council. Uh, by acquiring properties, restoring the wildlife habitats, and making them publicly accessible, this program is addressing the conservation objectives uh, laid forth by the constitutional amendment and the foundational natural resource plans that this council uses for its recommendation process, including uh, the Minnesota Duck Action Plan, uh, the Minnesota Pheasant Action Plan, the Minnesota Prairie Conservation Plan, and the Statewide Conservation and Preservation Plan, to name a few. Um, if I could have you take a look at the handout that Sandy just handed out. Um, at the bottom of the first page uh, is a chart with some of the numbers from previous phases of funding. As you can see, uh, phases one through seven are fully complete. The properties have been acquired and restored and donated to Minnesota DNR's wildlife management areas. Phases eight, nine, and 10, uh, work is still ongoing to restore those properties. Uh, phases 11 and 12, all ac um, we're still working uh, to finish up the acquisition and restoration work on those. As you can see by the handout, um, we've been able to bring a large amount of federal and other non-state match to this program um, in excess of $11 million, which in part um, has allowed us to acquire more acres and provide more conservation benefits and to uh, exceed the goals that we initially proposed. And so currently, uh, we have acquired uh, nearly 3,000 acres more than what we had proposed in all the phases of this program. Uh, above that chart is a picture um, from the Gary Clancy WMA dedication, which was uh, a little over a year ago. Um, you can see the socially distanced crowd there. So the Gary Clancy WMA uh, is a great example of the, of the WMA um, of an acquisition project uh, that was very successful and provides a lot of benefits um, to the citizens of Minnesota. It's 177.3 acres. Um, it had nearly 4,000 feet of shoreline along the Watanwan River. Um, there are highly erodible acres out there. There was a few gullies that needed to be fixed, um, some wetlands that needed to be restored. So we've restored the prairies, restored the wetlands, um, filled in those gullies, stopped the erosion, improves water quality, and obviously the wildlife habitat benefits um, that also come from that. And additionally, uh, acquiring this property uh, allowed access to some county-owned lands um, that Blue Earth County had that had been landlocked before that. So that's a great example of the kind of work that we're able to achieve in this uh, program and we really appreciate your support. And with that, we will take any questions. Questions? Questions? David? Ron? Just curious, somebody mentioned. Ron. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier that land prices are going up, up, up. What's this gonna do? Is that true? Is that what you're finding? What's it gonna do to your budget? <clears throat> Land prices are going up. Um, I'm expecting it's going to be more difficult uh, to acquire those properties. But I think the other comment uh, that Chair Hartwell said was 
wait six more months and it'll probably be a different story. Um, I think at this particular snapshot, um, we're facing some difficulties, but um, by the time that this money hits the books, um, it's anybody's guess what we'll actually be looking at for the land prices. Jamie? Uh, Jamie Becker Finn was just uh, no uh, offense to uh, all the guys who have WMAs named after them, but maybe we could be a little bit more uh, creative and not necessarily having to name everything after people. I know it's, um, I don't think it's a true reflection of, uh, of our state and I just, uh, I love our WMAs, they're one of my favorite places to visit, but there are, are way too many uh, old white guys' names that I have to memorize uh, when, I'm, when I'm finding places to go. And so just encourage you to think a little bit harder of, about the way we're doing that, and um, especially since hopefully these places will be around for a really long time. So, thanks. Duly noted. Other questions? I, I just had a question, you, your proposal shows 30 acres of restoration and yet a lot of money. Doesn't I'm, make sense to me. Can you yeah, explain I'm glad, it? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we added this as an inclusion last year to our proposals. Um, it's more of a, a technical change. Um, so all of the acres that we acquire um, will be restored, um, but those acres are not counted as restoration because they are counted as fee acres. Um, we added those 30 acres and the budget for that portion so that we could do work on existing adjacent lands. Um, what happens quite frequently is we'll buy a property um, to add it to the WMA complex and there'll be a section of brome that we're going to convert to native grass. And that section of brome goes right across the border onto the existing WMA. Well, we're going to have a contractor, seed ordered, field time, all the necessary work to convert that brome on the property we just acquired into native grasses, but we're just gonna leave the rest of it that was sitting next door for some other time. And it just made sense to us to, let's include something in the budget so that we can fully restore that whole area. Thank you for the explanation. I'm sure I'll ask you next year. <laughs> Any other questions? Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Tell Aaron to get well. Next is PAO2, Rim Grasslands Reserve, Phase 4. And I'll just note we're running a little ahead. If there are proposals that are, we're going to hear this afternoon, um, if those proposers could hang around, we might get to you this morning. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, um, Council and Chairman Hartwell. Uh, my name is John Vaz. I was just up here uh, not too long ago. I'm, I'm an employee of the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, um, and I'd like to talk about Rim Grassland Reserve, and I'm very excited about this program. Um, been involved as a project manager for the last four years. Um, this is phase four. Um, we've done some amazingly exciting things with the first three phases. Um, we're already well into um, phase three for funding, and we will probably have all of our funds allocated by July 1st of next year. So a uh, request today would be wonderful because that would dovetail in perfectly into a and what we've done in the past. And the interesting thing about rim grasslands um, is that it's protecting native prairie that is of moderate quality, not necessarily um, absolutely pristine. And I know there's been a lot of great work done by uh, the DNR and the Native Prairie Bank program, um, but they are somewhat limited in funding and they are, I hate to say, um, somewhat choosy on what what they decide to fund um, but I think it's important to protect moderate quality remnant prairie um, and do management <clears throat> and actually in, increase it 
um, you know, bring it up to a higher ranking in, in, in diversity. Um, working with Bowser uh, and working with the soil and water districts in Minnesota, um, there are 62 separate offices um, that help with this program and 62 um, opportunities for landowners to come in and basically ask that basic question is I'm interested in a program um, and they take it from there. Um, many landowners don't really know that they have remnant prairie on their property. Um, it's just to them it's just some non-cropped area with some rocks that stick out of the ground. Um, but I think the last three phases, we've demonstrated a very, very dramatic shift in the attitudes of landowners. Um, typically, like with CRP um, and other federal and state programs, the first thing is that it has to be cropped. Um, and I've heard landowner comments that, okay, first we have to destroy it, and then we'll get paid to uh, restore it back. Um, and this, is, this program is, is right opposite, 180 degrees of that. Um, we've done some great things on the Minnesota River Valley. We've uh, been working with local technical teams. There's 11 d different teams in the state as part of the, as part of the uh, Prairie Plan. And those LTTs are very influential. Uh, it's just a group of biologists and local governments that get together and just basically talk about habitat. And that is so important um, because they know the landowners. And you, know, you ask some of these people, they generally say, you know, I think I know a few people that, that would probably want to do this program. And that's really where it starts, right there. Um, there's also a right off the, right hot off the press, um, the, the new uh, Prairie of Minnesota Landowner Handbook that just came out. I don't know if you're aware of it, but that is also something, a tool that we use with landowners just to kind of describe what a prairie is um, and what they can do on their property to uh, enhance that area for wildlife. And I'll... I'll I'll put what books I have in the back if you're, if you're interested to take a look. But so another thing that we've done, uh, we, you know, we've, we've discussed the BIPOC question. I know that, that came up in the last application. Um, and we have decided with the Rim Grasslands Reserve that we will take a portion of our appropriation and we will work with the Conservation Corps of Minnesota um, and get them, some of these teams, some of these groups to go out on, on these sites and do light maintenance on some of these uh, rim easements, like removal of trees um, and other things. I have uh, I had the opportunity to work with some CCM crews a couple of years ago and they are extremely um, well uh, run and I was very impressed. Um, landowners were very uh, open. Um, that was a question as well, will landowners allow us to go on their property? Um, I think landowners think and their opinion is that they're, they're glad to see young, young people that are interested in, in the environment and, and conservation. Um, so a portion of our appropriation will go to a contract directly with the CCM uh, crews. Um, one other thing to note is that some of the landowners <clears throat> that we have uh, funded are tribal members. Um, there are three of them uh, from the White Earth Indian Reservation. Um, so we are working with tribal members. Um, and we're anticipating with the CCM that we would incorporate some sort of uh, tribal communication or, or working with the tribes, uh, particularly the White Earth Indian Reservation of Monoman and Becker County. So I'm very excited about this program. Um, I think it's, it's just getting its legs right now. 
Um, we sometimes, or with the Minnesota Prairie Plan, we say that there's 1% of remaining native prairie in Minnesota. Well, how do we know that? Um, we just assume that, yeah, we only have 1%. What happens if we, um, what happens if there's 2% out there or 3%? Um, I have listened to the, the council and their discussion. One of the uh, questions that came up was in the future, 50 or 100 years down the way, what would a person ask or wonder about funding from the Lassard Council? And one of those was, um, did they do what they, their mission was? Um, I think if they look back in retrospect and they see that we identified 1% of our remaining prairies, um, they would say, why didn't they do everything they possibly could to protect and restore that 1%? You know, like I said, maybe there's 2%, maybe there's 3%. We really don't know until we ask landowners, because um, like I said, a lot of them don't know what a remnant prairie is. Um, so I think it's a great program. You can't remake a uh, remnant prairie. Uh, we can identify these areas. We can protect them in perpetuity. We can provide a buffer. Um, I think it's a wonderful program, and I can tell you landowners are very, very excited about this program. So with that, I will take, take questions. Any questions? Jamie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Jamie Swenson. I, I may be mixing up my proposals, but I think in the past we've talked about uh, some federal leverage in regards to the RIM program in Minnesota. Can you speak to that if, if, if that's something that's still available or if there's a, if there's anything as far as a, a, a match or a, any leverage that could be uh, possible that wasn't included in the proposal? Uh, with this proposal, um, Councilman uh, Hartwell and members, um, this proposal for RIM grasslands doesn't have a match per se but uh, other RIM programs, like the CREP program, is, has a federal match. Um, the RIM wetlands, uh, we were fortunate enough to get clean water funding as part of the biennium. Um, that was last year. Uh, we anticipate and we hope that um, future um, clean water funds will be available, uh, and that would be a match. So. Other questions? Good enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on our list is PAO3, Prairie Chicken Habitat Partnership of the Southern Red River Valley Phase 8. Sorry, I was just checking that out. We ready to begin there, Mr. Chair? Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Faber. Uh, to my right here is Saban Adams. You already know who he is. I've been here before and testified, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I like to think of myself today as the color commentator. I'm not gonna give you a lot of facts and things. Uh, today we decided that my role would be to tell you a little bit about who is the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society since we're uh, the ones that are one of the sponsors of this proposal, the phase eight proposal of the Prairie Chicken Habitat Partnership of the Southern Red River Valley. That was not me that named that, by the way. Um, so just quickly, uh, my background, my day, I'm a natural resources instructor at Central Lakes College in Brainerd. I also serve as a governor's appointee on the LCCMR. For those of you that are new and don't know maybe who is that funny looking guy. Um, I wanted to then talk a little bit about, and then at my role here, I serve on the board of the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society. I've been in that role for about 10 years, been in the society for 20 years. Um, so the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society uh, was founded about just about 50 years ago. Next year, the year after, will be our 50th anniversary. Uh, it's kind of a small world how things can work. 
So when I was an undergraduate student at St. Cloud State, uh, my professor there, Al Gruy, uh, was one of the founding fathers of the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society not too many years before I got there. Um, I think he might be uh, smiling down on me today and a couple of my other colleagues that are here that are also members of the Prairie Chicken Society. Uh, he passed away quite a few years ago, but he was my mentor and good friend, and I ended up teaching for him for three years uh, near the end of his life uh, when I came back from overseas. Um, so with that being said, prairie chickens, think, looking at prairie chickens and their importance on the landscape, um, and I know I might be preaching to the choir, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, they're really the iconic species of prairie habitats in Minnesota, as I'm sure you all realize, uh, pra uh, prairies in general uh, and prairie chickens along with them are disappearing. We have less than 2% of that habitat type left on the landscape. And in my own personal opinion and professional opinion, I think it would be a travesty if we were to lose that iconic species, the prairie chicken, because of the loss of that habitat. Uh, the population is somewhat stable at, you know, between four and 5,000 birds, but there were a lot more quite a few years ago. But with the loss of, of prairie habitats, that has, uh, has declined dramatically. Um, what else would I want to say about the prairie chicken? Uh, Oh yeah, I wanted to lead into then looking at the outcomes. I'm not going to crunch numbers for you. You should have them on one of the uh, flyers you have, the one with the picture of all the people at a dedication of uh, what has uh, been named. This was a, a large uh, additional tract of 960 acres. It was the Prosby tract. Uh, so my question to you is, because I'm a college instructor, what does Cupido mean? It's the Cupido Wildlife Management Areas. Are any of you familiar with why, where did that name come from? Cupido is the species name of Tympanicus cupido is prairie chickens. Okay, now you've learned something, hopefully. Um, so that was the name of it. We had a dedication on that site uh, about three weeks ago. It was super well attended. And the other thing was to give you a time perspective on acquisitions, which I think that this, uh, this is phase eight. We've had seven good phases thus far. Again, uh, my friend and colleague here, Sabin, will go more into those numbers. Uh, after I'm done. By the way, do I get extra time because we're ahead of schedule today or just checking? Is that a no? Okay. I'll listen to you because you're the chief over here. Um, okay. Um, so the 960 acres was originally, as Mark would know, since his brother Earl was the wildlife manager out in Detroit Lakes, that tract was, was put on a acquisition list, if you will, probably over 30 years ago. And finally, after 30 plus years, Prosby, the people that owned it, decided it was time to let that unbroken ground remain prairie, and, and the, the deal was closed, I, I think, a little bit over a year ago. It's 960 acres, which is a section and a half of land. The existing area that was there, which was the existing Cupido Management, Wildlife Management area, is 3,000 acres. So the importance behind the, these larger complexes is in order to maintain prairie chickens, just like we will need to do with sharp-tailed grouse, which is you're going to hear about here in a little bit, is we need to have large continuous pieces of land and some connectivity between them. And I'm sure you all are familiar with the prairie plan and the reasons why that is. But I think the important thing here to understand is that how long it takes grooming relationships to get some of these tracks um, put aside and, and conserved on the, on the uh, landscape. So I could go on, and since I don't have extra time here, I'll turn it over to Sabin and let him talk numbers with you. Thank you. Hello again, Mr. Chair and Council members. Uh, glad to be in front of you once more today. Um, I'm looking at the handout more specifically. I will crunch some of the numbers. So um, as you can see, uh, phases one and two of this program are complete. We've acquired, restored, and donated all of those properties either to DNR as wildlife management areas or U.S. Fish and Wildlife as waterfall production areas. Uh, phases three, four, and five um, still have properties that we are working to restore. And phase six, um, we are still looking for additional properties um, to complete the acquisition on. So one of the things I wanted to steal some of your uh, color commentary, um, and you had pointed out, if you look on that picture, uh, on the left-hand side in the back row, there's a gentleman in a cowboy hat with a big white beard, and that is uh, uh, Earl Johnson, who happens to be Executive Director Mark Johnson's uh, older brother. And he was the area wildlife manager um, in Detroit Lakes for a few decades. And the day after the dedication of this property, we had uh, the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society annual meeting. And 
At the meeting, uh, Rob Baden, who is now the Area Wildlife Manager in Detroit Lakes, um, was up giving a presentation about this program, and he was going over specifically looking at each one of the 13 tracks. So he had a PowerPoint, and he's got a map of the property and a picture, and he's talking about each one. And every time that Rob would flip through his PowerPoint to the next track, Earl would gasp a little bit. He, he would gasp or he would like utter like, oh my gosh, like, oh wow. And it was kind of funny at the time. Um, but sitting there, I've had some time to think about it. And I've been doing conservation with Pheasants Forever for a, a measly eight years. So this council and the Outdoor Heritage Fund is older than my career um, doing conservation. And to sit next to Earl, who had been doing it for 20 some years, hearing him gasp at the work that we're able to do. When I come to work, it's, this is just the work that I do. Um, but to see how incredible it is, it was kind of a humbling experience to sit next to Earl and, and see how impactful uh, this work can be. So on behalf of myself, um, Pheasants Forever and the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society, I want to thank you for your support of all of these phases. And with that, we will stand for any questions. Questions? Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to share with you, this is, a, this is a problem we have here. There's like five or six or maybe more of a prairie restoration, prairie acquisition requests. And uh, you're, you're, of course, here in the name of prairie chickens, but prairie chickens could be in any of those prairies. So we don't know who does it best. Um, can't get those kind of details. Um, your thoughts? Well, I, I, I guess if I was just going to say it, um, we do it best. There you go. <laughs> That's what I thought you'd say. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> Jamie. Uh, now that there, uh, Jamie Swenson, now that there's been multiple phases, um, I noticed in the proposal you've, you've got uh, a couple of maps showing the, the ranges and, and where you found, found prairie chickens. Can you speak to um, all these projects that you've added in the landscape and if you've seen an increase in, in the populations and, and some of the monitoring that you've been doing? So um, to both of those, uh, we have seen some of the properties. It's mostly anecdotal evidence. That's the difficult part. Um, we've been doing this for eight years, which seems like, yeah, it's eight years, but you look at a prairie takes five, six, seven years from the time you put the seed in to actually seeing good quality prairie. It takes a long time for those things to actually happen. Um, so the best we have is um, a, a fair number of anecdotal reports from um, people who go out and count prairie chickens of, yeah, there's a new lek on that property. Um, thinking particularly of uh, the J.R. Dale acquisition in Norman County, um, which was a 600-acre acquisition um, a couple phases ago. Um, there are now, there's two new leks on that property. Um, I've heard from hunters who have harvested their ch prairie chickens on that track. And so right now it's mostly just based off of this is what we're seeing. Um, but I'm certain, you know, with more time and more research that gets done monitoring these populations, we will start to see um, some improvements. I might add to that. They're set so they won't turn off. Huh? They're set so they won't turn off. So oh, all right. Sorry about that. I was just going to add to what Saban said. Um, the Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society has sponsored the lek counts, the booming ground counts of prairie chickens for the last nearly four decades. It, because that wasn't a part of, of the, uh, the, uh, bio, the grouse biologist position with the Minnesota DNR, so we have run those counts ourselves. And so when you look at those numbers, and I had mentioned earlier that the population seems to be somewhat stable, it's declined a little bit, that's a measure of looking at the number of males coming to a lek. And so, you know, it, and it's been done the same way, basically on the same number of leks in the entire northwest uh, uh, area where, where prairie chickens are present. Um, and so I think that I would argue as a biologist that the fact that we haven't seen a dramatic decline 
means that, and over these last eight years, we're keeping some of these areas, remember, we're already existing as prairies, so it's not like they're additional to the areas. So I would argue that, that we're at least seeing, not seeing a dramatic decline like we've been seeing in sharp-tailed grouse populations, for example, over the same time period. Um, and I think that's a good indicator that if we continue to set aside these tracts of land, we're going to be able to maintain the population and hopefully at some point um, maybe even increase it. But at least it's stable. We're still having a, a limited hunt, which is I don't want to get into the, the right or wrong of the hunting because it's brought notoriety to the bird and bring you know, more, more publicity for uh, people wanting to hopefully save that icon of the prairie out there. So. So I had some stuff I'd written down when I read the proposal, uh, and, and one of my questions was uh, the proposal states that most tracks have remnant prairie. Why wouldn't you just focus on what has remnant prairie instead of most? Um, and then the, the long-term goal of genetic intermixing uh, requires 222,000 acres, which the number in my comment was five million, but it's really 500 million to do all of that work, which seems impractical to me. And, and I'm just curious if you've looked at actually moving birds in between flocks to uh, create the genetic interbreeding as an alternative to a half a billion dollars. Um, so to address the first question, um, did you want to take that or? You can take part. Okay. Can you say that first one? I'm thinking about the second one. Why are you saying most tracks have remnant prairie? Why yep. don't you buy just remnant prairie? So the goal of the proposal is to sustain or increase the prairie chicken population. And in the areas where prairie chickens are located is um, probably one of the best areas, uh, particularly the Beach Ridge, um, that has lots of remnant prairie. So many tracks that we are acquiring do have remnant prairie on them, but our focus is not specifically on Let's just protect the remnant, remnant prairie. Um, we'd also like to see the population increase, and it, to do that, we need to provide more habitat. And so we're looking at areas adjacent um, as well and making acquisitions where maybe this area has a ton of lex and lots of birds. Well, let's build some habitat here and get some lex and some birds um, off of those areas as well. And as far as the genetic intermixing and, and the um, moving of the, of the birds, I, I saw your comment and I reached out to Charlotte Roy, uh, the Minnesota grouse biologist with the DNR, and asked her specifically about this. Um, and one of the key things that, that she mentioned is there has been um, tons and tons of attempts um, to move birds, to spread genetics, to do some of, uh, uh, some of that work. And in most cases, it has not been successful. Now, specifically addressing genetics, one of the things that she has studied is the movement of prairie chickens across that landscape. You know, we've got Glacial Ridge up near Crookston, and then there's a decent gap of um, where there's not as much prairie, and then you come down into Clay County, and you got the Blue Stem Prairie, and there's kind of these clumps where there's more chickens and less chickens. And one of the things that, that they're finding is chickens move pretty good. Um, they can fly pretty darn well, and, and there is mixing between populations. And so the birds are moving, and the genetics are getting around, and there isn't that great of a need to move these birds to increase genetics. And as far as moving those birds to start new populations, there's just no good evidence to show that it will work. It has failed many times in the past. And I was going to add to that, uh, Mr. Chair, that we tried that. The Prairie Chicken Society was working with uh, um, John Teffer, who was arguably, while he was still alive, the, the foremost prairie chicken biologist. So we reintroduced prairie chickens to the uh, Laca Parle area over a time span of which was the early 2000s and so on. And uh, originally, it was successful. They started to move to some areas. There was some decent patches of habitat and things there, and it lasted while some of you remember Dave Trauba, who was the area manager there, spearheaded that, and so there was a lot of attention given to that, um, and it was it seemed successful, but you know things change over time, and they, they didn't you know maintain some of these prairie patches that were already there, and so initially, as as uh, Sabin mentioned, it didn't uh, 
it didn't succeed. It was good for 10 years, maybe a little bit longer, and then they disappeared. And, and they've done this before with prairie chickens in other places, as some of you might be familiar, the lesser prairie chicken, which is highly endangered. They're not having a lot of success with that bird down in central Texas. There's one refuge where they have them and they're captively breeding them. And they're just, it's a problematic species on the landscape. Um, the other thing I was going to mention too, David, was that they, we've been doing that also with sharp-tailed grouse. We've captured them here in East Central Minnesota and they were moved to Wisconsin because Wisconsin's sharp-tailed grouse population is almost extirpated. They're almost gone on the landscape. And that is showing a little bit of promise. They had, they marked all the hens that they captured and released over the last two springs. And some of those females have nested successfully and fledged some chicks. So that's always a positive indication, but is that going to reestablish or help to grow their population? We don't know. It just seems these guys are problematic to work with. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for your support. Uh, we're scheduled for lunch, but we're ahead of schedule, so we're going to move on to PA04, Minnesota Prairie Recovery Program, Phase 12. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Um, it's not part of my presentation, but maybe I'm gonna start off with the request. And Ron, I hope you asked me the same question that you just asked Saban a few minutes ago. I would be happy to, Neil. So who does it best? <laughs> Let, I'll say, let's save it to the end. Okay. Uh, so my name is Neil Feakin. I'm the Land Protection Director for the Nature Conservancy here in Minnesota. I just wanna start out by saying thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you here this morning. Uh, also to say thank you for your past investments in the Minnesota Prairie Recovery Program and for your ongoing commitment to prairie conservation in the state of Minnesota. It really is making a, a huge difference. Uh, so as I go through my presentation today, I wanna do two things. Um, I'm gonna really quickly do a highlight outline or overview of the phase 12 of, of the Prairie Recovery Program. But then I also wanna offer my perspective on the value of some of these long-term multi-phase programs. I read in some of the comments when you were reviewing your proposals, and I've heard at the last couple of meetings some uh, questions and concerns about the ongoing nature of the programs, and I just want to spend a few minutes uh, giving my perspective. Uh, some of you have heard my PRP or Prairie Recovery pitch many, many times. Uh, others are a little newer to the council. So just as a, a overview, PRP is an implementation tool of the Minnesota Prairie Conservation Plan, and we really approach it in that way. Uh, specifically, we are working to protect our threatened uh, native prairies, first and foremost, and then associated grasslands in a secondary fashion. Uh, prairie recovery also is working to enhance habitat quality on public lands. Uh, most of the lands we work on are either owned by the federal um, agencies, mostly Fish and Wildlife Service, or lands that the state has an interest in. Again, primarily wildlife management areas owned and managed by DNR. Uh, we also work to restore key parcels that expand and benefit habitat complexes. So we try to be very selective about where we invest restoration dollars. Uh, and then finally, uh, primarily through the protection aspects of this program, it's a, it, we think it's a highly impactful program for that impacts climate. Uh, we sequester an awful lot of carbon that we know is going to stay in the soil on a perpetual basis because of this, uh, these investments. Uh, so as uh, for those of you who are following along in your binders, most of the numbers and information is on the project illustration that was provided with the original proposal. But just as a quick overview of what we've accomplished to date, uh, we've protected over 7,000 acres uh, permanently at a average cost of around $2,000. Uh, we've enhanced about 165,000 acres of public wildlife habitat. Uh, so to me, that's a huge, huge significant impact on the quality of, of Minnesota's habitats. Average cost there has been about $120 an acre. And we're immensely proud of how cost effective and efficient that we're able to put this work on the ground. And then finally, we uh, have restored about 1,800 acres of those key parcels that create those wildlife habitat complexes. 
In total, we have estimate we have sequestered about 725,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over about the 10-year period that we have been uh, working on the prairie recovery. So I want to pivot with the remainder of my time and talk about, again, the, the, the value of these long-term programmatic investments. And I don't, I want to throw a caveat out there. I'm not diminishing or minimizing the value of the individual or those smaller projects. Uh, all conservation is critical to this state. We're not in a position where we can um, say that we don't need every single acre of conservation that we can get. So they all have value, and I'm not trying to say that. Um, but what I want to talk about is what we can accomplish through these multiple phase investments. And I, I created a handout. Sandy handed it out. Thank you very much, Sandy. And it's just a graphic depiction of what a change in a landscape can look like through uh, repeated uh, and persistent investment and work. Uh, the front side of the handout is the picture of the sheep grazing on it. And that's our Ordway Prairie Sand Vig Preserve. This is a, about a 100-acre parcel. It's right across the road from the Glacial Lakes State Park in Pope County. Uh, when we were approached in 2013 from the, the landowner who was interested in selling it, I personally I was a little skeptical because it looked like an oak forest. And if you look at the panel on the left side of the handout, you can see what the starting state looked like. And oak forest has a lot of habitat values. They're great. I love them. Uh, but it wasn't exactly what PRP was intended to do. But as we walked the land, what we started seeing was some of these ancient, gigantic burr oak. And their presence suggested to us that that wasn't actually an oak forest. That was an oak savanna. That just had had many years of uh, neglect and, and non-management done to it. And so we, we decided we were going to take this challenge on of restoring that oak savanna, primarily because oak savanna is one of the rarest habitats that we have left in the state of Minnesota. And it's incredibly important to a number of wildlife. Red-headed woodpeckers are one of my favorite species, and they need oak savanna in order to thrive. So we, we purchased the land with outdoor heritage funding, and then we started the restoration. And the, the bottom panel in the middle, the first thing we did is we brought vendors in to start clearing that understory out. It was covered in buckthorn, garlic mustard, uh, box elder trees, kind of just a bunch of junk, and it wasn't really providing a lot of habitat. So it took a few years. I mean, that's a, this is a, it's a big effort. So a couple, two or three years to get that brush removed. As soon as we opened that canopy up, uh, we got a huge flush of young buckthorn. And that's just, for those of you who have managed forest land, that's what happens when you clear land. The buckthorn comes in. And so we brought seasonal crews, uh, TNC crews, uh, private vendor contractors again to start getting that re-sprout under control. We worked with the neighbor uh, to bring their sheep in, and their sheep went crazy on the garlic mustard. And I love watching sheep eat garlic mustard because that means we don't have to pull it. Um, and at the end of the day, you know you've got a, a, a successful savanna restoration when you've got a land that can carry a prescribed fire through it. The panel on the left, we never could have burned that. There's just not enough fuel there. But through an uh, eight to 10 year effort, we've finally gotten it to where we've got enough grass, prairie grasses, prairie flowers, and oak leaves that we can burn in the fall and get a fire through there. So what we're doing is we're moving from a, a heavy, a restoration standpoint, and now we're to a maintenance standpoint. And if we keep fire going through there every three to five years, we're going to maintain the quality of that savanna habitat. That wouldn't have happened without the repeated investment of phase three, four, five, six of prairie recovery. Um, had we not gotten, if we'd have just had two or three years worth of funding, we'd have cleared the brush out, and we'd have probably been in a state of that re-sprout control photo, and it would have started going back towards that oak forest understory. So to get to the, the optimal condition uh, in this particular case took those repeated uh, infusions of funding from this body and a persistent work from the biologists at TNC that, that got the work done. A similar story on the back side of the handout is our Lake Johanna Esker Preserve. Again, this one's in Pope County. We also purchased this one with Outdoor Heritage Funds in 2013. Some of you have been on this property. When you had a field trip there a few years ago, we, we actually got a chance to walk it. Um, but when we bought it, it, you can see on the top two panels, it was con 
almost completely covered in red cedar. First thing we did again, hire a bunch of vendors, come in and slick those trees off. Uh, very similar to the Oak Savannah story, when you do that, particularly in this, this landscape in central Minnesota, sumac starts popping up. So you gotta go back and, and kinda keep nailing that sumac, you get invasive species, thistles like that sun, and so it's just a repeated effort to get that, that land into the condition that you, you'd want it and need it to be in. And so where we're at today in those bottom panels, and unfortunately this picture was taken this summer, so it's not as colorful as it would have been last summer with, with a little bit of rain, but we have taken a, a piece of property that had a lot of potential and turned it into one of the best native prairies in um, central Minnesota, in my opinion. Uh, I would love to get the council back out there uh, to take a, take a look at these projects in person, so Joe, next time you guys have a field trip, put me on the list. Uh, with that, I think I will close my presentation and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions, Ron. Ron already asked his question, <laughs> you already answered it. No, I didn't answer it. Could, no, but, we, it. but we know how you will. Uh, no, I, no, I don't. Uh, I, I think the answer to your question, Ron, is the Prairie Recovery, uh, I'm sorry, the Minnesota Prairie Conservation Plan is where the individual groups come together to strategize our work. And that's not just a static document. Uh, we still continue to come together, the 11 partners that put it together. We meet um, at least quarterly to revisit that. And then we talk about the different work that's going on. And I was going to lead off with a pitch for the Minnesota Prairie Chicken annual meeting. Everybody should join that because that's the funnest meeting of the year. Hanging out with Earl for the day is super fun. Um, but you know, Saban's answer, I'm not sure I'd say that now. But, um, but everybody's work uh, is, contributes to this. This is an 18 million acre landscape. It's incredibly uh, endangered and threatened and altered landscape. and it. Uh, to, quote a, to quote a saying from the, the 90s, it, takes, it really truly does take a village in, in prairie conservation work. All right, any other questions? Ron, another question. Yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Chairman Hartwell to figure this out for us sometime because he's a numbers person and I'm not. But what I was getting at is that um, we're trying to, we like to say, get the most bang for the buck. And so we've got five or six uh, organizations trying to doing the same thing, preserving prairie, restoring prairie. I'm kind of curious about who's the most effective with their dollars that we give them. And I think that's something the council uh, we should consider, as long as we're trying to get the most bang for the buck. But I'm, I'm, uh, my, my math is horrible. Chairman Hartwell's, uh, he's a genius at that, so your turn to answer that, Chairman. If everyone would just come in and say they want to do the same thing on the same <laughs> property, I could answer your question. That, that, and that's the right answer. We're all doing such different work. Uh, Pheasants Forever does a lot of restoration. They're buying stuff in the agricultural matrix, which is a really expensive proposition, but it doesn't mean it's less effective, cost effective or efficient than the Nature Conservancy doing an oak savanna restoration, which also that particular 100 acres was much more expensive than us running a fire across a, well, a previously managed and maintained WMA. So it, it, it's kind of out, it's an apples, oranges, pears kind of question. Thank you for taking me off the hook. Uh, so I am curious, you know, in the past you've gotten about half of what your request is or a little less. Uh, um, your request calls for, for uh, uh, protection specialists and prairie recovery biologists, two full-time people or close to, no. Two years working, uh, five and a quarter people. Um, and your, ans your proposal indicated that if you got half the money, you wouldn't change that staffing pattern, which didn't make any sense to me. Can you elaborate? I, I will do my best to try and make it sense, make sense of that. Um, a lot of the money that would be 
off the table uh, with reduced funding is uh, contract money and it would be the actual land acquisition funds. Uh, we have uh, a certain number of folks working on the project, so we have a collection of three protection specialists who spend a part, part, part of their time building the pipeline, putting transactions together, and closing deals. Uh, we still would need to be out finding those landowners and doing that work. We would just have less money to actually close on more transactions. Same thing with the enhancement. Uh, I, I have four prairie recovery biologists stationed either in DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service offices across the state. Um, we would reduce our number of seasonal staff, which will reduce our acreage, um, but, we, and, but we'd also lose a lot of contract money, which once you get the contract in place, the labor is done by somebody else, so it's not like super labor intensive, but we still need those same people in the office to spend the money that we'd have. Okay, other questions? Good enough, thank you for coming down today. All right, well, thank you again for the opportunity and for your uh, support of Prairie Conservation. Uh, we're gonna do one more before lunch, I think, PA05, uh, Enhanced Public Land, Open Landscapes, Phase Two. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Council today regarding our Enhanced Public Land Open Landscapes Phase 2 proposal. I'm Dave Pauley and to my left is Becca Clute, um, Pheasants Forever Restoration Specialist. She will address you after I <clears throat> finish my discussion here. <clears throat> I'm the president and habitat projects coordinator for the Minnesota Sharp-Tailed Grouse Society, of which I am also a life member. The Sharp-Tailed Grouse Society was founded in 1986, and we're a smaller conservation organization of approximately 250 passionate and dedicated members with a focus on sustaining sharp-tailed grouse populations and their habitats. And in fact, from our inception, the mission statement has been dedicated to the management and restoration of sharp tails in Minnesota for hunters and non-hunters alike. And we continue to aspire to that work to meet that goal. I'd like to give the council a uh, a brief background of this iconic native and indigenous grouse and its association with open land, shrubland, grassland habitats in the transition zone of Minnesota. Sharp tails evolved in open landscapes to maximize successful breeding behavior. <clears throat> They're a lecking species, which means multiple males assemble on the spring in the spring on the lek, which is often a traditional annually used site on elevated ground to conduct the display dance. And uh, you can reference the front and back page uh, handout to visualize what a dancing male sharp-tailed grouse looks like when he's in full uniform. There's a lot of uh, stomping of feet, rattling of tail feathers, inflating of purple air sacs, and cooing, along with uh, the males challenging each other in that, on that lek. This is often called the dancing grounds, as it appears that that is what the birds are doing. They're there dancing and displaying in order for this uh, 
to be an effective strategy to attract females to this arena, it must be located within a panorama where the sounds can carry over a significant distance. Quality nesting cover has components of both grass and lowland shrubs of both upland and, habit upland and lowland habitat types, and those are in relative proximity to the dancing ground. Broods require similar cover to forage on insects, leaves, and seeds. And the flocks, consisting of adults and the young, utilize these same kinds of habitats, but over a slightly more expansive area throughout the entire year for food, roosting, loafing, and predator escape cover. The dancing grounds is the epicenter of the sharp tail life, and therefore, a per, in a perfect world, the surrounding habitats of approximately four square miles should be a mosaic of these cover types with early successional vegetation features. And you please reference the back page of that handout for a visual description of that four square mile area. This is all about sustaining habitat for this unique firebird, and that term firebird originates from indigenous peoples because they recognized that sharp tails were very, very much associated with open landscapes, and those landscapes were there because of routine fire activity on that landscape, keeping those vistas more open and um, preventing overgrowing of woody vegetation. <clears throat> and this will also help sustain the breadth of biodiversity in these often forgotten shrubland complexes in the transition zone, from monarchs to moose, yellow rails to elk, and more. All of these are important to Minnesota's natural heritage. Sharp-tailed grouse are a species of greatest conservation need in Minnesota, historically holding the prestigious status of being one of the top three game birds in the annual harvest over several decades. The threats which are impacting population declines at present include habitat loss, habitat degradation, habitat conversion, and habitat fragmentation. All of these are potentially magnified by climate change factors as well. And this has been recently highlighted by the dramatic reduction of active dancing grounds in the East Central Range of sharp tails in Minnesota, followed by the subsequent 2021 season closure. In an attempt to mediate and reverse the habitat decline scenarios, the sharp tail Grouse Society embarked on a new funding campaign beginning in early 2017, actively interfacing with the Expedited Conservation Par Partnership Legacy Grants Program. To date, we have been awarded 22 grants these grants have a $50,000 funding cap, so it's necessary to work in close conjunction with area wildlife staff, targeting habitat renovation and rehabilitation projects within a one, with, excuse me, within one mile of active remnant or relic dancing grounds. ensuring the highest and best use of these conservation partnership legacy dollars while enhancing sharp-tailed grouse habitats. These habitat projects are located primarily on state lands, most often on wildlife management areas, but also on other kinds of public lands, and occur on the fragmented habitat complex scale rather than the landscape level scale. We are focusing our efforts to mitigate habitat loss and lek declines in what is rapidly becoming 
disjunct and isolated populations. Again, reference what has recently occurred in the East Central Range of Sharptails. The proposal before you was created by the Partnership of Minnesota Sharptail Grouse Society and Pheasants Forever. Funding from this proposal has great potential to expand endeavors to a landscape level, most importantly because it will create habitat corridors, thus enhancing the interconnectedness of isolated populations. And projects from this proposal will also work in tandem with the Sharptail Grouse Society Conservation Partnership Legacy Grants, generating more effective, expanded habitat complex restorations. Thank you for your time, and I'll turn it over to Becca now. I just wanted to provide a brief update on the work that we've uh, done with the funds that was received in fiscal year 20, and this can be found on the bottom of the back page of your handout. To date, we've contracted 3,374 acres for approximately $617,685 of the $873,000 that was allocated for enhancement. We've completed approximately 1,727 acres and spent $329,900. Um, the goal, again, of this proposal is to enhance over 5,000 acres of open landscape habitat by hiring private contractors to mow and shear brush, remove trees, install fire breaks, perform prescribed burns, seed high diversity native seed mixes, and install fence for conservation grazing. Again, our priority is to target this four mile area surrounding the LEC, uh, both at, re at active and recently inactive LECs in the Northern Forest and the Forest Prairie Transition Region of Minnesota. With your support today, we'll be able to uh, bolster the population of this iconic species. And with that, we'll be happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Questions? Ron? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious, there was a pretty serious decline in the East Central region that was announced not too long ago. Um, does the, is the DNR showed any concern for that decline and do they, to your knowledge, because I don't have it, uh, do they have an active program to manage sharp tails? Um, yes, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, the Minnesota DNR is very aware and they do take the declining population for sharp tails seriously. Um, if you actually look on the back page of your handout, um, there are some images of a recent brush mowing project that we completed in conjunction with the Minnesota DNR on the Aiken WMA and the Rezac addition to the Aiken WMA. Um, and that is near uh, an active sharp tail lack. Um, once the work was completed there, we did observe on numerous uh, events, small flocks of sharp tails. So um, yes, they are working themselves um, to manage the sharp tail population, however they um, still need help because this is a, um, a very time sensitive, sensitive issue. So, um, you know, we're needing to bring all of our partners together to um, hopefully turn the population decline around. I would also say that, but I would also add to that what recently was noted as an extremely dramatic reduction in LEC numbers and in dancing males in East Central Minnesota range was something that the Sharptail Grouse Society and the DNR Wildlife recognized perhaps as, as long as 20 years ago that that decline was becoming obvious. And even in 1986, <clears throat> declining poptails, sharp tail populations was the reason for the sharp tail grouse society forming. So we've recognized that situation with sharp tail populations, especially in East Central Minnesota, for a pretty long period of time. And in past years, we were successful at um, garnering what was then called heritage enhancement grants, pretty, pretty significant chunks of money 
to do on the ground sharp tail habitat work. Um, when that was phased out, that was about the time we decided to get, get involved with the conservation partnership legacy side of things. Um, and I actually, as an area wildlife manager in East Central Minnesota for more than 25 years, I was responsible for monitoring those dancing grounds each spring. And I saw that decline occurring and so after I retired and became a life member with the sharp tail Grouse Society and a pro Habitat Projects Coordinator, um, recognizing there was dr a dramatic need to inject considerably more money to try to um, undo what was happening to that habitat in East Central Minnesota. It was, it was becoming and had already become toxic to sharp tails. So nearly half of our dollars from the 22 grants has been spent these past years or encumbered these past years in that East Central range. So. Tom, you had a question? Uh, yes, Tom Sachs. I, uh, is any of this, particularly when you get into these transition areas like East Central, you know, Hinkley or, you know, in that area, uh, and my, my brother has a place down there. You think any of it's affected by climate change? I think that there's a, there is significant evidence to say that climate change is having impacts on that habitat. One of the reasons why those habitats in the transition zone, especially in the East Central Range, have gone toxic is because there have been limited windows of opportunity for prescribed burning to occur in traditional springtime situations. And so that brush never got rejuvenated and now it's 10 feet tall and very closed in and rank. Um, and the other situation is, is on the flip side of the rainy spring situations is that um, the, the current example is all of the fires occurring in Minnesota under these droughty conditions. And so um, when area wildlife staff and even contractors through the sharp tail grouse CPL projects were assigned to conduct prescribed burning. They forego it in the spring with the intent of doing August and September burning, but then the windows aren't available because it's red flag days or it's out of, you know, out of the um, windows of, of uh, the prescriptions for the fire. So yes, I would say that climate change factors have had an impact, you bet. Just as a, just an example, I was using the prescribed burning situation. I, I wonder if you have tried coordinating with the project we funded, the roving crews, to do some of the work, or if you have to contract to do all of this yourself. So uh, thank you for your question. Um, in some instances, we do go ahead and we will install the fire break, which sometimes requires um, specialty heavy equipment. Um, so we will go in and we'll install the fire break and do prep work and then the roving crew may come in after and perform the prescribed burn. And on the east central side of the range, it has worked kind of the opposite. Roving crew did built the fire breaks as in used a, a, a mechanical brush more to actually create the fire breaks so that then the contract um, prescribed fire crews could conduct the burn safely within the specifications of the burn plan. Jamie? Uh, thank you, Chair. Jamie Swanson. I, I really appreciate this proposal and, and your presentation today to help us understand how uh, projects are targeted in regards to the range around the, the LEX. I, I, I'd like to see these types of projects. It helps me understand um, with, 
with so much prairie opportunity across the state where we can actually see a measurable difference. And so it, it's helpful for me to see projects that are, are focused on sharp tails or focused on prairie chicken to be able to see that we're, we're making a difference on, on the landscape. And so I, I really do appreciate this project and thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate your work. Uh, we'll break for lunch. We'll get back at 1.10. Thank you, Council.